Well, as Soren mentioned, I've been, I've been at this for a while. Um, I'm probably best known for the first book I wrote, which was called Crossing the Chasm. And Crossing the Chasm was about the challenges that a startup faces when they take a disruptive technology and they seek it to get adopted in the mainstream market. And it, it's a set of challenges that that, uh, that book was written in 1990. It, it's still in print. It's, it's sold over a million copies around the world. And so it's, it's, it's a very good set of frameworks for dealing with a a, a, a perennial problem uh, of introducing any disruptive technology. The book I want to talk to you about today actually covers the same journey, but it covers it from the point of view of an established enterprise, not a startup. This is a company now, this is an institution which has an ex a core business that is mature, that is, that, is, that is throwing off significant amount of returns, and now this business wants to uh, catch the next wave. But it's the next wave, not the first wave. And it turns out it's a very different problem. And so the frameworks that are, that are, that are good for crossing the chasm, are, are, they, they still describe the market dynamics rather well, but they don't describe the internal dynamics. And I was listening to Mr. Russ talk about uh, just before the break, and, and the kind of corporate antibody immune stuff and those kinds of challenges. And Clay Christensen wrote a book called The Innovator's Dilemma. I mean, we've, we've talked about this problem for a lot, but we haven't done a lot to solve it. And so the intent of the frameworks I want to share now is this is how I think you ought to solve for it. That's the intent. So it's about catching the next wave. What we're going to see is it creates a resource allocation challenge. It becomes ultimately a crisis of prioritization. It is not one that most companies face effectively. Most companies fail at this moment, and it's very damaging when they do. So it's incredibly important to me that we stop doing that. The framework that I'm going to suggest to sort this thing out is something called zone management. It was developed with Salesforce.com and with Microsoft over the last three years, working with Mark Benioff and his team at Salesforce, and Satya Nadella and his team at Microsoft. So two high pedigree organizations, I think very good place to get started. And, and we're going to talk about it in, 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 a, in a series of, uh, of modalities, which we call attacking, uh, defending, and sustaining. So that's where we're heading. Um, maybe just to kick it off with one thing. We talk a lot about disruptive innovation. Uh, and you know, I think we're all very sensitive to the fact that it feels like it's coming faster and faster and bigger and bigger. Um, the question at some point when you have that is, so how the hell do you know which ones to worry about? I mean, you can't, you can't do them all. And so where do you do, how do you decide? And by the way, I'm going to ask you that question at the end of this talk for your company. So you might not, you might want to pay attention just for a moment before you get to your cell phones. So, so the, the key idea here is that what the, I think the orange, the orange subtitle is, is the key idea. A disruptive technology becomes actionable in your segment and in your company when it takes the marginal cost of doing something that for you in your history was very expensive and very challenging and created a barrier to entry and drives it close to zero. And now all of a sudden, it effectively changes the design rules for a next generation person coming in, in, into the industry, whether that be you or, 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 be, or be a disruptor. So whether you're the disruptor or the disruptee, this is when it's important. So take cloud computing, for example. So cloud computing has taken the marginal cost of deploying software globally to zero. Now again, not for an established enterprise. An established enterprise is still running a bunch of on-premise stuff that's got client-server architecture. When you add cloud computing to an established enterprise, that is an additional set of things. And so now you have a hybrid architecture of on-prem or private cloud versus public cloud. And you have to bridge it. And it's more complicated. But if you're Aaron Levy, as a sophomore in USC, you get to start Box, which is now a $300 million public company, in your dorm room and deploy it globally effectively for free. Okay. So the design rule for the disruptor has changed. So how, how big a deal is that in your industry is what I want you to start thinking about. Mobile does the same thing for, in, for connecting with people. We've got a billion people now on our planet that have smartphones going to two billion apparently during the, the rest of this decade. You can talk to, to uh, one to two billion people on this planet for free. Now again, 
Probably not in your organization because you probably have CR client server CRM systems and you have different directories and you have all this kind of stuff that, that makes it even more complicated. But if you're Brian, if you're, I mean, if you're Brian Chesky at Airbnb or you're Travis Kalanick at Uber, that's what you just did. You just took over the world for free. Brian, Brian doesn't buy any properties and he, and he employs no property managers. He's the world's largest hospitality organization in the world. Travis owns no cars and he employs no drivers and he's the world's largest transportation. So, you, so when these things, when the marginal cost goes to zero, all hell breaks loose. And so it's really, really important. Now, it doesn't, it, 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 not in every case in, in every industry. The oil and gas people have not been, frankly, neither of those things have affected the oil and gas industry, for example. Big data is the next one. And now they're getting less free. These things are now getting less and less free right now, but you can sort of see they're, they're going to be approaching the asymptote called free going forward. But, but big data. So now all of a sudden, we, we, the notion that we could capture all of the log files from whatever is the relevant digital traffic to our application intent, whether we're seeking terrorist activity, whether we're trying to do social signals to do, to do uh, uh, promotional stuff, if we're trying to optimize ad spend with retargeting. I mean, there's a bunch of places where we're doing this. And if you can analyze the decision uh, data, uh, relevant data at any scale, that was not possible. It's, it's with elastic computing and elastic storage, it's getting, as soon as you separate compute from storage, because we spent most of our lives putting it together around social, you know, storage area networks and network attached storage. Well, when you detach it completely, all of a sudden you can start participating in this asymptotically approaching free and you start saying you don't throw away data. In my lifetime, that would have been the dumbest thing you could have said. The whole purpose of analytics was to throw away the data because you couldn't afford to store it. Okay? This is, this is a, di a different game. Right? Machine learning still coming in, and machine learning is not free. In, in the US right now, uh, I have a friend who's, uh, whose son is a uh, computer science st student at, uh, at Dartmouth. Uh, he's just entering his senior year. They are now getting job offers at the beginning of their senior year. So it's like, and, the, and by the way, they, they're, they're, they're comparing them. The biggest job offer in Josh's class was somebody got $150,000 a year salary and a $100,000 signing bonus as a junior, okay? So it's like, you want your children to marry these people. I mean, let's just hang on. Okay. But the point about this machine learning, what we're seeing with machine learning is, look, it's not free, but once you get the algorithm up to speed, the algorithm runs for free. And, 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 you, and you start watching, you're imagining with, you know, you're going to take out huge swaths of labor. We had that question uh, just before break about the social implications of all this digital disruption. What's going to happen to all the lorry drivers if you have self-driving cars or self-navigating drones or, or whatever it is? So what, but what, what machine learning does show you is it starts off, when it starts off, it's dumber than dirt. It's not very smart at all but it never, get, it, oh, it never gets more stupid, it, unlike the rest of us who, as we age, do. But, but, but it, it gets smarter and smarter and smarter, and eventually it beats Gary Kasparov. And eventually it does drive a car. And, and so, so optimizing any digital system, and then if you have the Internet of Things, well, if you put a sensor on a physical object, you just made it a digital object. So you look at this thing and you're saying, look, this, these are design rules in various parts of our, of our economy are being changed by these technologies. And the question is, wh where for you? For example, I, I had a conversation with the chief innovation officer at Wells Fargo Bank. It's a, it's a big retail bank in the United States. Here's, here was his reaction. Cloud computing, meh, we got a big, big, big footprint. We're kind of our own cloud. Not, not important for us. Smartphones, table stakes. Smartphones have completely changed retail banking. Millennials think branch banks are creepy. They don't want to go inside of them. We have 3,000 of them. You know, so, so we have to sort of change the platform. Uh, big data, um, yes, but not until really machine learning. Machine learning is our future because now we can do algorithmic underwriting and use social signals from, from PayPal or from, or from whatever uh, you know, uh, 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 digital uh, financial transaction clues, and we can, we can do better stuff. Internet of Things, not so much for us. 
but you see how different companies could pick out different ones. So I, I want you to be thinking about which one's for you. OK. Whatever one you pick, you say, look, we're going to catch the next wave. Well, who better to catch the next wave than tech companies? Well, start reading this list at the bottom and start reading it upward. And when you hit the line where you don't recognize the company's names, that's when you came into the industry. Okay. Now, some of us in the room might be able to go all the way to the top. I'm thinking Simon over there might be able to go pretty far up. ICL is not on the top list, but it could be, OK? The point about this, by the way, these were not the bad companies. These companies crushed it the first time around. That's how they got on the list. I mean, they just killed it. But when they went to catch the second wave, they, and they tried multiple times, you cannot imagine these companies with the amount of working capital they had, publicly held companies, very strong boards of directors. Would you go to your board of directors a year and say, well, we don't think there's anything new to invest in this year? Um, right? So every one of them every year had a strategic plan to catch the next wave, whatever the hell the next wave was at that time. And they didn't. So it's like, hmm. Why is this so? And by the way, because you'd like to think, well, we're smarter than they are. No, you're not. Okay, let's just be really clear. No, we are not, you are not, they were not stupid. The problem was they were, uh, my, my framing of this is they looked at it through the wrong frame. And when you, when you look at it through the wrong frame, then you, 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 you find it very, very difficult to solve for the problem. So I want to reframe it. That's what the rest of the stuff's about. So how do you sort of break the back of this thing? And I think the guys at McKinsey gave us a really good starting point. So this, the McKinsey model is called the Three Horizons. Anybody here in this room heard of this model, the Three Horizons? OK. It actually comes to fruition during the annual budgeting process. And, the, and, the, and the, it's designed to answer a very simple question. If I give this initiative or this organization resources in the annual plan, when do I get paid back, with it, obviously with interest? And, and the McKinsey model says there are three legitimate answers to that question. Answer number one is this year. Answer number two is not this year, maybe next year, more likely the third year. And answer number three is uh, three to six years, and frankly, maybe never. Okay? I mean, you, this, you know, I'm not sure. So, so when you look at this, and you looked at those, those 54 companies, you say, well, how'd they do? Well, when it came to saying, give me more resources this year, I'll give you more sales next year, give me more salespeople, give me more engineers, you'll get more software, these people did just fine there. Established enterprises know how to manage the, the, the Wall Street next quarter, next year, fiscal year. That's how they got public and stayed public, right? That, that, that was very, very successful. The rap against them for most of the first decade of this year was, you know what, they really can't innovate. They can't do the really exciting new stuff. We need to get new people to do that. Turns out that's just bullshit. That's a technical term we use in California. Bullshit. <laughs> it, it, they're, those, they're those every one of those companies had labs that was doing fabulous work, really cool stuff. IBM Labs, Nokia Labs, HP Labs. Look, Xerox Park. Xerox Park essentially funded Silicon Valley for 15 years with R&D. The only company that couldn't use it was Xerox. So why not? Why couldn't Xerox use Xerox Park? And the answer was because they couldn't get it through Horizon 2. So what's happening in Horizon 2? So, so if you think about it, so Horizon 2 if it's, it's the annual budgeting process. And the, the Horizon 2 business sponsor comes to the table and says, you know, we're going to take this thing to scale. It's a big, big opportunity. I need, a, I need a big amount of cash to do this, and I'm not giving any of it back. And then next year, I'm going to need a bigger bucket of cash. I'm not giving any of that back either. Okay. And then maybe in the third year, we're going we're to be seeing the great re returns from this thing. Well, that's, that's, that's where we got stuck. That, that, that just was too hard for the organization to swallow that pill. And so the way in which we ended up trying to net this out in a single sentence, the sentence ended up being, if you're going to catch an S-curve, meaning one of these waves, you have to go through a J-curve. And so we all know what a J-curve looks like. 
Now, what's interesting about J curves is from the venture capital point of view, venture capital is set up exclusively and explicitly and solely to prosecute J curves. The limited partners who put funds into the, into the venture capital uh, organizations, who give the money to Sequoia and Kleiner Perkins and Andreessen Horowitz and Moore David out, all these companies, they give it explicitly to invest in J curves. The general partners then interview entrepreneurs with business plans, and the only plans that they take seriously have big whopping J curves in them. And then the entrepreneur, if you join one of those startups, you know your number one job is get the hell through the red part of the J curve as fast as you possibly can, which probably does mean working 15 hours a day, six days a week. And by the way, if you didn't come in on Saturday, don't bother to come in on Sunday. I mean, it's just, that's the game. Now, it's a hard game to win, and a lot of people don't win it, but, but nobody is conflicted. There's, there's, everybody is completely aligned around what's going on. That's the crossing the chasm game. Now, you want to play that in an established enterprise that has a core business, where you're not funding it out of venture capital, you're now going to fund this out of operating cash flows. You go to your investors, you say, hey, we've got this incredible opportunity. What do you think? They go, eh. No, 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 no. You went through the J curve. Don't do it again. No, no. Earnings per share. Stick to your net. Look, you got a great business here. Don't screw it up. You know, keep, keep it going. Cash flow, cash flow, cash flow, right? Free cash flow, FCF, right? The salespeople, you say, well, hey, look, it, this is really cool. These people are going to love it. And the salesperson says, it is cool. But um, I want to go to club. I want to go to club. If I'm going to go to club, I have to make quota. And there's no way I can make quota selling the new thing. Because A, nobody has any budget for this thing. It's so new. So I'm going to have to actually go create budget before I can consume budget. B, to be honest, the thing doesn't actually work. I mean, it's a, it's a great demo, but it's getting there. C, none of our partners know how to support this thing. D, the only people I know in the companies that I'm calling on are the people that bought the last generation stuff whose jobs would probably get marginalized if we sold them the new generation stuff. So I'm completely out of pocket. It's like, no, no, I don't, no, no. And then the sales management right behind him are going, do you want me to make my number? I mean, I, mean, I can give you some resources for this, but that, I mean, I, how am I going to make my number? You want me to make my number? Yeah, we want me to make your number. Okay, I thought so. Thank you. Okay. And then the customers, even the customers will be doing, this is very exciting. I, you know, really, I'm not exactly an early adopter myself, though. I, we like to like wait and see a little bit. And in the meantime, could you actually deliver on the last release that you haven't actually delivered on yet? So they're kind of going, eh. And your partners are going, hey, come on, guys. We have a sweet deal here. Don't screw it up. Just, come on, just play the hand you've been dealt. It's a great hand. So what happens is, you're to unlike the, the venture back thing, which is not conflicted, you're totally conflicted in this model. And, and, and the thing that becomes important is, is we, we have to realize, look, this is, this is the actual a actuality. This is not a mistake. It's not like somebody has made a mistake. It's not like this is a mistake. Nobody on this slide has made a mistake. All they have done is said what is. That's all, we, that's all it's just data. And so we, as we were processing that data, you start thinking, well, what, would, what was the paradigm we had that was not helping versus the one that could help? And one of the ways to look at this is to say, look, when you think about innovation, I always thought of innovation as a funnel, like a big cornucopia, and you put a lot of ideas in the top, and You'd sort of work them through the middle, horizon, and horizon three, horizon two, horizon one. It's time, you know, it's, it's time. And, and, and the good ones will come out the bottom. It turns out that model is actually okay for sustaining innovations, for innovations that complement and supplement your existing core business. That's exactly, you can have stage gates. I don't know if you've ever managed innovation through stage gates. Stage gates are fine for a funnel. They are death for an hourglass. Because when you get to the middle of that hourglass, you can't get through the stage gate. 
you just stop everything. You have, it's, like, it's, like having, it's like having an embolism or something. I don't know, it's having something bad in your, in your, in your intestines. So the, what, 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 the, what the horizon, oops, excuse, oops, sorry, there we are. Um, what, what the disruptive innovation model says, it's interesting. It says, the world obviously loves your Horizon 3 business, uh, Horizon 1 business. Interestingly, they love your Horizon 3 business. They think it's cool. When Watson wins Jeopardy, woo woo, you know? Or, or the, or the go, Alpha Go beats the Go guy, cool. Deep Blue beats Gary Kasparov, yeah, yeah. But now you want to do what? And now what you want to do is take a massive amount of resource out of your core, because there's not enough resources to go around. So now you're going to take resources out of a proven moneymaker to bet them on something that has still in the middle of a J curve. And it's just like, woo. And all of a sudden, the temperature in the room goes down about 10 degrees. And people start looking at it like that. So the point about this exercise is there's a choke point in Horizon 2. And interestingly, it's not an R&D choke point. You don't solve this choke point by giving the people more R&D. What they need is more go-to-market resources. That's the scarce resource. That's the envelope you're stretching. Because the same go-to-market resource envelope that you want to prosecute the core business, you want to take, take that same envelope and now stretch it to prosecute the new business, even though you know they're very different. So what you will do, by the way, is you'll ha actually have an overlay sales force do the new business, because they're going to be specialists in the new business, which is fine. That actually works, but it's hideously expensive. And the first year, you can get away with it. And the second year is ghastly, and the third year is terminal. Because, because, because as this thing scales, it, the, 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 the financial upside down gets, it's a J curve, right? It's a J curve. It's this, and, and, you're, and publicly held companies with core businesses are not organized to prosecute J curves. So this was the key insight. Bringing a disruptive innovation to scale is not a natural act, okay? It puts your whole organization in conflict with itself. It's an autoimmune disorder, right? It basically causes the organization to go against itself. So then you say, well, okay, Jeff, are we done? Can we just like start drinking martinis now? I mean, you know, because what the hell? One and done, is that the name of life and business? No, I'm not gonna make that suggestion. I just want to ha have us own this reality because then the question, and by the way, this is the reality that Microsoft was confronting, and this is the reality that Salesforce was confronting. Okay, and I'm gonna submit to you that they both are prosecuting this reality successfully. So how is that possible? Sorting out the conflicts. So the key idea behind the zone model was simply to say there are legitimate interests inside the corporation that are in conflict with each other. And the, and the first thing to do is to sort them out, to get clarity around each of the interests, but to isolate it from the other interests that it is in conflict with. And so this two by two matrix does this rather well. So you have the disruptive stuff on the left and the sustaining stuff on the right. And everybody kind of gets, don't put the disruptors with the sustainers. I mean, nobody's, we figured that out a long time ago. And then the other one is bringing home the bacon in terms of revenue and, 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 and profits versus not being below the line. So you look at those four zones. And three of them, I'm going to submit the, 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 uh, the three that are not the transformation zone. I will submit you have in your company today that if I walked into your company today and I walked onto a floor and I talked to three people, I could tell you which zone I was in. And I will submit to you that you do not have any two zones on the same floor because they don't like each other. They, it's not that they don't like each other. They don't hang out with each other. So let's talk about the three zones. The four zones. So the first one, Horizon One Performance Zone. This is where you know you you uh, make the number. This, this this is it has a culture of commitment. You commit. You commit to make the you weekly commits. You have quarterly commits. You have the annual commit for sales quota. You also have a commit as a developer. I'm going to build this on time, on spec, on budget. Not which two do you want, right? I mean, this is a commit culture. This, this, is where, this is where you serve the world. The world experiences your company through the performance zone. It's, it's where you make money. It's where your investors, and by the way, it's the zone that your investors inspect very closely through your financial reports. But it's also where you execute your mission. If you fail in the performance zone, you're failing your mission. Okay. So th 
This is, this is you. This is the you that you are sending out into the world. This is what we're here for. But in Horizon One, it's largely the you that you have built up to date. It is what a lot of people call their core business or core business sets. It, it's the flywheel that runs the economic engine. And, and people, you, you run it in a, in, a, in a very, I mean, most large companies have very clear systems for doing that going forward. They can be improved. And by the way, the book talks about how to improve systems in all four zones. But for the purposes of our talk tonight, let's just take that as, OK, that's our core business. We kind of we know what we're doing there. The productivity zone is all of the cost centers that fit below the performance zone and enable it to perform. So finance is in the productivity zone, HR, all of IT, legal, marketing, customer support, procurement. A and anything that anybody that doesn't have a number in their comp plan. So if, you're in, if you make it or you sell it, you're in the performance zone. But if you're doing anything else, you're in the productivity zone. And those two zones soak up 95 plus percent of the total budget every year. I mean, that's kind of where, in fact, in my father's era, my father went through 40 years of business without one disruptive innovation touching his industry. So he spent his entire life just in those two zones going, going forward. M many mature industries uh, can work that way. But, but for everybody in this room, I will submit you have an incubation zone. You have some place where you are at least testing the waters, maybe organically, maybe you have a, a minority investment in a, in a startup, you know, maybe you're doing a tuck-in technical acquisition, but you're doing something over here to test, to test the water, to invent the future, to get a flavor of you know, what's going on. And that culture, but this, by the way, this is a commit culture. This is a collaboration culture. This culture is, 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 is wants to be helpful. It's continually, and its job is primarily to help the performance zone, okay? to, to, to do whatever it takes behind the scenes to make the performance zone successful. And then the incubation zone is supposed to be completely on the other side of the page. Don't do what the people on the right-hand side are doing. Get ahead of, get, we're sending you out ahead of everybody. Go off and be, be effectively brilliant. And those three zones I submit exist in your company today. Is that fair? Okay, I think it's fair. Now, by the way, each zone feel, feels slightly superior to the other two. So if your people in the creativity zone, they're pretty sure they have 10 to 15 IQ points on you pretty much to a man, woman, or child. Yeah, they're just uh, probably 15 IQ points smarter. The people in your performance zone, We'll never stop reminding you, we are the people that are paying for everything around here. We're the people that make the money, for God's sake. We're, and the people in the productivity zone will say, are we the only adults in the room? I mean, it's like, is that what's going on? So each zone has a culture. We've all kind of known each other. It's a little bit like Thanksgiving dinner. You know, you can kind of hang out with each other. But usually I'm at one end of the table, they're at the other end of the table, whatever. But, but, but it works, OK? And, and, and then there's, and, and these three zones exist, and I would submit every year they exist. That is not true of the transformation zone. I, if I go into your into company and I look high and low, I will not find the transformation zone because it doesn't exist. It is a temporary construct that you bring into existence for the sole purpose of going through a J curve, of taking your company through a J curve. And that requires a, a complete change, a, a radical re reallocation of resources that goes against the grain and certainly against the inertia of every process you have going. And that requires a command culture. And it requires the CEO to step in and say, I am taking control of the boat. I delegate the ship for most of the trap. Well, I, I just flew over from, uh, from Los Angeles. For most of that flight, I am reasonably certain that the, the chief pilot did not have his hands on the tiller, or whatever you call it on a plane. But I'll guarantee you when we landed, he did. Okay? And, and, and that's kind of the game here. So, 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 so th but that's, that's when it comes into existence. So you say, OK, how do you? work this system, now, now let's go back to our annual budgeting process. And we say, OK, so how does this actually work? And then we're going to look at the transformation playbook itself. Well, if you're budgeting and you're not going through a transformation, if you've decided that 
yeah, there's very interesting technologies around, but this, this is not our year for a J curve. How do you do the budget? How do you prioritize the zones during the budgeting? Well, the number one priority is the performance zone. We got it, we're, we're gonna make our number, right? That's how we fulfill, we're gonna do our mission in the world. So do we have enough salespeople and selling capacity to make our bookings number? If we don't, let's add more. Do we have enough delivery capacity, software engineers, professional services, product, whatever it is? If we don't, let's put the money there. That's first. Now, after that, it's like, okay, now let's, the, I'm, let's, we have a huge stack of programs that would make us more effective and, and systems that would make us more efficient. It's, it's, it's an infinite list. We can't fund everything. But, but let's fund as much of it as we possibly can in support of the performance zone doing its mission. And by the way, let's put something into the incubation zone because we don't want to get caught completely flat-footed. So, and, and in good years, we'll probably put a little bit more in, and in lean years, maybe a little bit less in, but, but that's what we're going to do. So the, the, the envelope looks like this. There's nothing in the transformation zone. This is what we call a good year, right? Your investors will like you. You will get home at night. You will even occasionally go to a, a, one of your children's school events. I mean, you know, your, your, your spouse will not be in negotiations with a lawyer by parting uh, ways with you because she, he or she will have seen you. Uh, I mean, the point is, this is a good year. Um, and by the way, just to put this in perspective, even in tech, if you negotiated one transformation per decade, which is something that those, none of those 54 companies did, one per decade, I would, you would be world class. Now, it's, Apple did three, but that, you know, it's like, I'm sorry. Everybody has somebody that blows the grade curve, right? But, but if you just, if you did one per decade, which means, and I, and I think they take about three years. The J curve, the venture experience with J curve is, it's, it's a three year, it's a three year play. So that means seven out of the 10 years, my wish for you is this is what you're doing. And we just keep doing. And by the way, all those things we criticized, the silos and all that stuff, silos make this thing work very efficiently. They're horrible at changing, but you don't want to change. This is, these are the seven years you just want to get more mileage out of the same opportunity. So you actually do put in place the silos that you're going to regret for the other three years. Okay. Okay, but, but you do. Okay, so sweet deal. Why would you screw this up? Two reasons. The first one is the one that we, we um, work with Mark Benioff and his team at Salesforce on. So this is, um, we called it zone offense eventually, because you're voluntarily putting your company into a state of risk. Why would you do that? Because you believe you have something in your incubation zone, either because you acquired it or you built it organically or most likely a combination of both, and you want to scale it to material size. I want to get it, and material size in this model is 10% or more of total corporate revenue. Total revenue for whatever your go-to-market envelope is responsible for. At 10% or more, your investors, your partners, your customers go, wow. You, you're, you're in the new business. It's, it's real. I mean, it, it's real. I mean, who knew? Apple's in the music business. Who knew? Right? Apple's in the phone business. Who, Amazon's in the, in the uh, cloud business. Who knew? But, until, but IBM is not yet in the Watson business. Watson is not 10% of IBM's revenue. So IBM reports out Watson is under analytics and AI. But the ampersand is, is a design. It allows them to put in a lot of core legacy business to keep the number big enough to be interesting, right? Which is totally appropriate. By the way, everybody knows what they're doing, but it's a, it's a totally appropriate thing to do. But the point is, what Jenny Rometty has got to do at IBM right now is she's got to take that to there. So if you do that, that has to be the number one priority. And this is the thing that the 54 fellows didn't do. By the number one priority, that means when the performance zone person says, well, I have to make my number, the answer is, well, I sure as hell want you to make your number, but that is not the number one priority. The number one priority is if we go into a J curve, we are coming out with a 10% or greater business come hell or high water. 
That is the number one priority. There is no higher priority. Nothing takes priority over that outcome. Because the worst thing you can do to your company is take it into a J curve and not get out. That's how those 54 companies, by the way, you can, one doesn't normally kill you. If you look at those 54 companies, two, three, four, five, but every one of them is like, like a, just another, another self-inflicted wound of serious, serious import. So that raises an important question. If you don't think you can get to a J-curve, if you, for whatever reason you're uncertain, then the key response is you must not start. Most companies start and say, well, let's see how it's going to turn out. That, that's, that's the death. That, that's, that's deadly. No. No, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it. So therefore, be very thoughtful. And it's no accident, by the way, if who's been successful with this stuff? Founders. Yeah, Mark Benioff. Well, yeah, he owns 20% of the company. You know, Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, you know, Elon Musk, Reed Hastings, Larry Page. Sure. So, 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 so one of the things that allows found, uh, the, the people to do zone offense is there's often a charismatic founder that still has a huge stake in, in the thing. And basically, they, they can kind of do a my way or the highway sort of, sort of mandate. The problem is, I don't know about your companies, most of the companies I deal with are not run by founders. The CEO is a hired employee. Office, in, in Europe, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh generation. Okay, not the founder. So that makes it even more challenging, which means that the, and we'll talk about this in the transformation playbook, you have to socialize this, this intent across the entire executive team. And we have to get the entire executive team to make that commitment, because if you don't make that commitment, you're not going to get through the J curve. And then the productivity zone's here, and whatever else is in the incubation zone, not now. Not now, not now. Find, find, find another, another home. So here what you, the, the key is, but because that, what that number one means, and you'll see it in the transformation playbook, you have to enlist everyone in making the big change. None of those companies did that, the 54. Meaning, the, comp the, the executives who were in charge of the other functions and the core businesses did not make it their number one priority that the emerging business get to 10% or greater scale. What they said is, I'll make my business work. And I'll use my resources to make my business work. You will not get through the J curve. There is not enough resources to play that game. Everybody, every leader of every business and every function in the productivity zone has to commit 100% that, that, that you get up every day, every morning, and you say, is there something I can do to accelerate the growth of the, of the transformational business? Because every day that it is subscale is a bad day. It's a bad day for me. It's a bad day for the entire company. So we're going to do it. So that's, that's, that's the game plan. Okay. Having said that, I think this is maybe one out of five. This is a big ask. To ask somebody voluntarily to, to put, particularly if you have a family business, there are aunts and uncles and saying, what are you doing? You know, I mean, the, the number of, the amount of you, you think public companies are hard to run? Run a family business. I mean, if you think you're, a public board's hard to deal with, just try dealing with your blood relatives. Okay. So anyway, so, so, so I think this is not common. The one that's much more common was the Microsoft example. Microsoft didn't have something in its incubation zone that said, let's take this to scale. Microsoft had three of the very, very best businesses we have ever seen in the high tech sector. The Windows operating system business, the office, office uh, automation business, and the, and the SQL Server led back office software business, and they just print money. And the, by the first, first five years of this, of this century, the re financial returns are spectacular. Okay? What happened was all three of them took a direct hit to midships from the next generation technology torpedo. So, so Windows. Windows in, in 2001, I don't have the actual statistics. I would bet you that 85 to 90 percent of all devices, edge devices that were sold in the 2001 to 2005 period ran Windows. In the second quarter of this year, 20 percent, less than 20 percent. They did not get 20 percent share at the edge. 
Oops. Right? And remember, every time you buy the new windows, then you want to get the new office to put on the new windows. And, and, then, and then, so that, that was number one. So then the office business is, we don't, by the way, they didn't have anything that ran on mobile. Office only runs, ran on Windows. So, they, so, 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 then, so that was their problem number two. And then all that back office service, uh, all that really, really lucrative back office server business, cloud. So Microsoft has the phrase existential threat. These technologies have put my core businesses under an existential threat. Not a tough to compete thing. Existential, the way Kodak, the way digital photography put Kodak's film business under an existential threat. And so the insight that, that, that and I think Balmer probably had this insight, but he didn't have the right personality to, to take it to scale, but Satya does. He said the insight is you cannot fix a business under existential threat if you leave it in the performance zone. Meaning, you cannot ask it to both modernize itself and meet the, the revenue goals, the bookings goals, and the contribution margin goals that you have traditionally said, plus an extra X percent because we want to grow every year. That's not, you're not going to be able to do both those things. And so, so you're going to do a J curve. It's a different kind of J curve because part of the J now is you're taking one of your workhorse revenue engines offline. So you're kind of, you're kind of dampening your own J, as it were. It, 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 they started this with, with, uh, with the back office software business. So, so basically, they said, we're gonna, we're gonna move it to the cloud. Well, the cloud was a hideous J curve. Now, if you have to go through a J curve, it does help to have like $100 billion somewhere lying around. I mean, it's, it's helpful. But the point is, they, they still had to, to report out these financials. And, and they, they're going through a hideous J curve. And even now, I mean, Azure is, 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 the margins on Azure are not particularly attractive. But the growth rates and the meaning, and having this, you know, this cloud that has a lot of stature with enterprise IT, it's, it's, it's a very powerful asset. And you've seen Microsoft stock price do very well on the back I would say primarily of their success with Azure and secondarily with Office. So then when they had the Office issue, they, look, the, the, Satya was saying cloud first, mobile first. Chi Lu takes over Office. He says, well, I have no product that's mobile and no product that's cloud. Hmm, okay. So, so he goes and he buys a couple of mobile products to just jam that in, and Office 365 has been their cloud play. And again, Office 365 is... I think it's, it's not, maybe it's not quite yet back in the performance zone, but it's certainly getting there. Most people are going at the margin, yeah, we'll, we'll use it. But it's still, it, it, it's still it not, nowhere near as profitable as if you bought it under the old enterprise license agreements. And it's still threatened by Google Apps because it, Microsoft Office is a personal productivity software suite, and the world is going to a collaboration productivity software suite. And so you've seen them come out with things like Team. It's their Slack compete. They're, they're doing all those kinds of things. But the point about it is they relaxed the performance zone demands on, 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 that, on that thing to do that. So when you do that, you make that the number one. Now what you do is you go into your incubation zone, whether, again, through acquisition or through organic innovation or whatever, and you find whatever you can in that zone that can modernize your core business to get it back in the game. You don't have to leapfrog the disruptor. You just have to get your business close enough into the, into the same zone that people can go, well, I never really wanted to switch. And if, if, if Microsoft is getting that close to Google Apps or that close to, to Amazon, I, I can live with that. It's not, I, I get that it's not as good as, but I have a huge stake. I've got so many you know, places where I'd have to change if I switched vendors. The last thing I want to do is really do that. So that's what modernizing, modernizing the business is all about. But by the way, the performance zone comes in third and undoubtedly is going to, is going to take a hit. The good, I don't know if this is good news, but I'll call it good news here. Everybody knows you're going to take a hit. It's obvious you're going to take a hit. And the fact that you're proactively embracing this challenge actually encourages investors and customers and partners, not discourages them. Because they see that you're under existential threat. And they can see that if you don't do something, that, that this is going to be bad. So again, you enlist everyone, in this case, in modernizing the existing business. 
the current business. So this, so this, so so what is the ask then? So what, what, what is the playbook that you would have to say, if I am going to do a transformation, what is it I really have to sign up for? Because, again, I've said that founders do this. Well, well, founders have that extra gear. If you're not a founder, I think you have to have a very thoughtful discussion with yourself, with your lead directors on your board, and with your, the, your trusted advisors on your executive team. Do we have the will? Do we have the clout? Do we have the unity? Can I create a coalition of the willing to do this or not? And if the conclusion is, you know, probably not, that's not a horrible conclusion. It just means no J-curve. You know, if the answer is not, then we're not going to start it. So here's the playbook. Playbook says transformation trumps all other commitments. That's the fundamental idea. Failure is not an option. By the way, people look at VCs, they say, wait, why failure? VCs, look, they, three out of four fail, or two out of three fail. It's OK to fail. It's OK to fail with other people's money. <laughs> it's not OK to fail with your money. <laughs> The, the venture model is set up on about a three to one win ratio. It's, it's the way it's, the, the whole model is set up that way. You're, you, they're not spending operating cash flow. They're spending venture capital. Right? It's, a, it's a totally different financial transaction. So in an, in an operating cash flow funded situation, failure literally is not an option. Everyone's badge is on the table. Making the hot rise in one number is important. But it's not the top priority. In fact, I gave this uh, conversation to a Warburg uh, Pincus offsite of CEOs about three weeks ago. And one guy said, hey, Jeffrey said, I want to say this differently. He says, transformation, there are only two rules. The first rule, transformation is the top priority. The second rule, there are no other rules. Okay? It's, a, it's a version of saying, making, making the second bullet there. It's just a really clearer way, I think, of saying it. Which means total alignment is required. This is, what, this is why I said, do you, can you create a coalition of the willing? Because if you cannot get total alignment, you can't make this thing work. So the CEO is in command. You cannot delegate this. The CEO cannot say, well, I'm going to have this executive vice president lead this charge. No. Because the CEO is the only person who has the right to take resources away from other core businesses and give it to the fledging business. I mean, no, 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 no executive vice president has that kind of power. It's a new narrative for the investors. The board of directors has to be in full support. They can't be saying, well, yeah, but you're going to still make your number, are you? If that's what they're saying to you and you're the hired CEO, you have to say, no, I'm not, and then have that conversation. And if you discover they say, well, you have to, OK, then we're not, we cannot prosecute a J-curve in our company at this time. And we will not. And I'll show you. By the way, I'm going to show you what you can do if you don't, because it's not like you're condemning yourself to death if you don't go through a J-curve. There, there, there are legitimate alternatives. The third one is executive compensation is universally tied to this one outcome. You want the entire team to reinforce this prioritization by seeing that their discretionary bonuses are keyed overwhelmingly to the success of this, of this one outcome. By the way, stock options are a great way to do that. Because if you, particularly for zone, well, for both of them, your stock price should, achieve, should uh, uh, in, uh, increase dramatically in the case of zone offense and highly appreciably in the case of zone defense uh, and therefore make those options very attractive. The key, the key milestones, if it's zone offense, it's got to get to 10% or more of the total, of the total thing because until, it, until that tipping point is reached, everybody is giving you the doubt of the benefit. And then after the tipping point, you will get the benefit of the doubt. But, you, but until you're getting the benefit of the doubt, you just you cannot take your foot off the gas pedal. And in terms of, an, a, of resuscitating an existing business, you don't have to get it to meteoric growth. You just have to get it back to single digit growth that is reliable. Because what it'll show is I've absorbed enough of the new disruptive technology, I've incorporated enough of the new design rules that I can build a profitable business on back of my existing installed base and I can defend it against the barbarians. That's what the world needs to see. So faults and fixes. Fault number one, this one, uh, I did a bunch of work with Cisco in the uh, first decade of the century. I have a huge respect for, for that team and John Chambers in particular, but John would never, ever, ever have only one thing 
one J, he always had more than one J curve going at the same time. He just, he just, he just couldn't, couldn't not release them. It turns out there is no, ch it's, it's incredibly um, stressful to a corporation to go through a J curve. It, there is no chance you could take a public company through two J curves at the same time. It's just, it, it's, just it's, it's crazy. The, the, but why do people do it? Because they have, there's a cliche. Don't put all your eggs in one basket, right? It's, it's a very good cliche. It's a very sensible cliche. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. So I, I have a new cliche. Chickens lay eggs one at a time. Okay? If a chicken tries to lay two eggs at the same time, it's bad for the eggs and it's bad for the chicken. Okay? That's number one. Okay? Number two, withdrawing support before the tipping point's reached. This happens a lot. This is the classic failure mode. You put on the overlay sales force, you do all the things, you're actually growing, you're succeeding, but you're upside down financially to the point where your CFO is apoplectic. And you have to, and they say, you, we've got to figure out some way to, to, to cut the burn, da 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 da. And the problem is, in the middle of a J curve, if you show any sign of flinching, all those people sitting on the outside watching are, should I go in or should I not go in? No, 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 no. They all pull back. And, and, and you can never get momentum back. So, so you cannot, you cannot uh, flinch. And then the third one is letting anybody on the team opt out of taking accountability for the transformation success. No. Everybody has to be on the same page. And quite likely, if you have multiple lines of core businesses, it is highly probable at least one senior executive, someone who has been an anchor tenant for your business, someone who's been a pillar upon whom you have relied on, you will have to replace. And you cannot dilly-dally with it because every day that the person who's not committed to the J curve is in place, they're sending a message to the entire organization, it is okay not to support the J curve. And it's not. It's not. It's fatal not to support the J curve. So transformations are defining moments. They simply must succeed. So given that, which is a pretty chilling recipe, it raises the issue Okay, Jeff, you know, you're saying this is some sort of hero ball. I'm pretty good, but I don't think I'm teed up to be a hero, at least not this year. Now what? So this framework is a way of saying, look, there are at least three routes to absorbing a disruptive innovation into your enterprise and getting value from it. The most conservative route is to say, I'm just going to take the new technology and I'm actually going to optimize my existing systems without changing anything outside of my technical envelope. So I'm going to go to the cloud. I'm, I'm not going to build a new data center. I'm going to, I'm going to, get, I'm going to, I'm going to outsource that thing. Or I'm going, to, I'm going to do a BYOD, bring your own device to work, and I'm going to stop buying laptops for everybody in the company. You know, or I'm going to do some sort of mobile device management, mobile application management kind of thing. I'm going to do a bunch. I'm going to put Wi-Fi in all the conference rooms. I'm going to do a bunch of stuff. It's, going to, it's great. It's going to make us more productive. Uh, people will, will be more collaborative. Life will be good. But I'm not, I'm not upsetting the apple cart. And ideally, in fact, people would just experience these things as, as nice uh, incremental additions to life. Perfectly legitimate thing to do with disruptive technology. The next one up is, eh, no, we have to be more aggressive than that. We want to change our operating model. We, want, we, are, we are a cab company fighting against Uber. We need a mobile app that lets our customers do self-dispatch, you know, call a cab, have, watch it come to them, and probably pay for it with their mobile phone. But I'm not Uber. I still own my own cabs. It's not a new business model, same business model. But I changed my operating model. I, I don't have as many dispatchers. You know, I, I, have to, I have to retrain all my drivers. I've got a bunch, I've got a bunch, I've got to re-equip them. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff. And the key thing about the, changing the operating model is the IT organization doesn't have enough budget to do it. So if you're going to do the orange one, you have to actually go to the performance zone, to the people that are actually you know, going to change their systems. You have to say, you, have to, you were going to hire 10 more people. You're going to have to take some of those headcounts, and you have to give that money to the IT side so that they can build out this mobile system or build out this 
you know, digital, you know, maybe, maybe it's, it's some version of chatbots in our customer hotline or, or, or whatever the heck it is. We're modernizing our operating model, but we're still in the same business. And then the third one is, no, we're, we're, we're going to change our business. We're going to add a new line of business to the game. That is the transformation zone play. But, but the idea is you can play this at three levels. And it, it, it kind of, it, it kind of, one of the ways to kind of get which level you're playing at is how much pressure am I putting on, on my vendors? If you're just doing the infrastructure stuff, basically you're putting product pressure. Just you know, product or as a service offer pressure. You know, just give me better stuff and I'll, I'll make my gray area better. If I'm changing the operating model, I need a bunch of solutions. I, I, need, I, need, to have, I need to have business process reengineering. I need new application software. I, 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 need, I need something that's going to work you know, across a mobile network. Whatever the heck it is, I need that. And then if I'm doing the business model, it's, it's an end-to-end -end project. It's, it's, it's open-heart surgery all the way. So if you look at this, what this says is that there are three legitimate paths forward with any disruptive innovation. And what I would wish for you to do is I would wish for you to, to bring your stuff into the incubation zone now. Just use your incubation zone dollars now. Whatever you think is the disruptive wave in your world, get it in your company now, but bring it into an incubation zone. So just get, get your fingers dirty with it. Get somebody you trust to help you get your own perspective on it. Because if you do decide to scale it, you're going to want to have an inside executive help lead the transformational effort or, 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 the, or the, the, tra the transition to, to the other, to other zones. So, so do that. And then make the call. You know, ma ma make the call. You know, hey, this is one that we're just going to put into our platform of normal IT. We're just going to be a better, more efficient company. Nope. We are going to change, we're not, but we're going to still have the same customers. We're still giving them the same value proposition. We're just going to do it in a much more modern way. Or, no, you know what? We've got a new business, maybe a new ecosystem. We're going to build. We're going to do that. And I would say that transformations are the exception, not the rule. So my last slide is um, it's just a question for you, which I would love for you to take away. I'm not sure quite sore on how to, how to, how to manage this. but. But maybe we don't do it right now, given our time. But maybe you can take no, we it. Are, we are doing it now. So, um, oh, OK. <laughs> yes. OK. All right. OK. So the idea behind this question is, for your in industry and your enterprise, if you had to just pick one of those five waves to prioritize over the other four, which wave is the most disruptive at present? OK? And then the second question is, if you engaged with that wave, which of these three arrows would be the most productive way for your company in 2017, given the realities that you are facing, what would be the most productive way you could do that? Thank you, Jeff. So um, we want to keep you up here a little bit. Or no? yeah.